This chapter is the chemistry of microbiology. We're going to be looking at chemistry just from the standpoint of what you need to know for the microbiology uh, to make sense. You cannot separate chemistry and biology anymore. They're intertwined. So even though this is not for a chemistry class, we're just going to go through the very fundamental basics. Like I say, for what will you need to know for having the physiology uh, in microbiology to make sense to you. So we start off first talking about atoms. That's the smallest chemical unit of matter. And what is matter? That's anything that takes up space and has mass. When we look at the structure of the atoms, there are different uh, components of it. The ones that we are going to look at are the electrons, the neutrons, and the protons. Now, the nucleus of an atom is simply the structure that's in the middle. And just let me clarify, when we talk about the nucleus of an atom, we are not talking about the nucleus of a cell. It's totally different. Nucleus just means the center. In terms of size, uh, atoms are very, very small. Uh, you, you cannot see them under the microscope as you could a uh, cell. The electrons, uh, these are subatomic particles that have to make up the atom. They uh, have a negative charge to them, and they are circling around that nucleus. Now, some uh, times, and depending on what book you read, they have been described as cir circling around that nucleus in an orbit. Uh, some of them refer to it more as an electron cloud. Uh, some people say it's more of a circular orbit, others say it's more of an elliptical orbit. As long as you know that it's it's not in the center, it's not in that nucleus, and it's in constant motion moving around that nucleus, and that it does have a negative charge to it. Now in the nucleus you have two subatomic particles. You have the neutrons and the protons. The protons have a positive charge to them, and the neutrons are uncharged or, or neutral, if you will. And so this diagram is showing uh, a model, it's called the Bohr model, of that atomic structure. So as you can see in the center in that nucleus, you have the positive charged protons, the neutral neutrons, and then those uh, negatively charged electrons, as I said, are in these shells or in these orbits uh, circling around the nucleus. An element is composed of a single type of an atom. So you can have like a, a carbon element, a hydrogen element, and it's only going to have that single type of atom that comprises it. The atomic number, that is the number that's equal to the number of protons that are in the nucleus. And so that's going to vary between each element. That's part of what makes up the characteristics of it. The atomic mass or the atomic weight is the sum of the mass of the protons and neutrons and the electrons. So in this table, it does show some of the more common elements that we see in biology associated with living things. Um, I will say that uh, the most common elements in most living things, there are four major ones, and those would be hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. Some people remember it by the word, uh, saying the word con, C-H-O-N, and each letter stands for one of those elements. Now in this chart, it does show you the element, the symbol, the atomic number, the atomic mass, and what the significance is of that particular element relative to biology. Isotopes, these are atoms that will have a different number of neutrons in that nucleus. You have stable isotopes and you have unstable isotopes. The unstable ones in these are radioactive isotopes in that as it naturally goes to decay, it releases this energy, this radioactive energy that can be measured. <coughs> so an example of isotopes, uh, one example is with carbon. Naturally existing carbon is going to do what you consider normal carbon would be carbon-12. You have six protons, six neutrons. Now, carbon-13 is an isotope 
And this is where we're saying it's an isotope. Why? Because it has an additional neutron. It has uh, seven neutrons instead of six. And then you also have carbon-14. In this case, you have two additional neutrons, so you have a total of eight. Carbon-14, so both carbon-13 and 14 are isotopes of carbon-12. So that just means they have a, a different number of neutrons. Specifically, carbon-14 is a radioisotope. It's going to decay naturally, and as it does, it does release uh, some energy, and as I said, you can measure that. Why is this important or significant for biology is that living organisms, whether you're talking about microorganisms or larger things such as plants and animals, when they use an element, if they need carbon in this case, they need carbon and they use it. And they really do not distinguish between the isotopes. They will use it in the same way. What does that mean to us? Well, it means we can use the isotopes for research and diagnostic purposes. If you want to study a pathway of a large compound that's maybe composed of carbon, I personally have done this in the past when I was doing research. We were looking at various uh, what you call recalcitrant compounds, compounds that are very hard to break down. We were trying to see if fungi and bacteria could break them down in a form of bioremediation. So what we did is these very large compounds were carbon-based compounds. We would substitute some of the carbon, some of the C12 with C14. The fungus or the bacteria is going to use, if it can use the compound, it's going to use it. It doesn't care whether it's the carbon-12, carbon-13, or carbon-14. It's carbon. It's going to use it. And so... <clears throat> Because carbon-14 is radioactive, it's very easy then to measure because of that energy that's being released and follow or trace where is that carbon going. It's Like I say, it's easier to use for research purposes, for diagnostic testing, etc. There's pros and cons, so it can make it a little bit easier to trace the disadvantages. Radioactive isotopes can... Uh, cause different types of additional problems. Number one, they can, depending on the type, can cause mutations. So they can be harmful to you. You do need to watch your exposure to it. You do need to take extra precautions as to how are you going to dispose of this waste product. You cannot just throw it away. Um, and so you have to weigh and balance the pros and cons of if I say I'm doing research, what is the benefit of what I may learn from the research? Is it worth the additional problems that can come from it? How am I going to deal with disposal issues, safety issues of being exposed potentially to a dangerous compound, etc.? The electrons that have that negative charge. They are the only part of the atom, really, that's going to be involved with different chemical reactions that then determine characteristics of various chemicals. So those electrons are going to occupy these orbits or these shells, and they're going to fill them in order. So they're going to start filling the, that shell that is closest to the nucleus and then uh, in a very sequential order fill moving outward away from the nucleus. It must fill a shell to completion, to be completely full, before you can then move on to the next shell or the next orbit. Valence electrons, that refers to the electrons that are in the outermost shell. So you may have, say, three different shells, but the valence electrons are going to be only those in the outermost ones, because it's the outermost ones that will be involved with chemical reaction. There's different ways of drawing this. Usually uh, the way it's drawn is what you see in the lower example, B, the two-dimensional view. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The first shell, it, like I said, it's very sequential in how it's filled. The first shell can only hold two electrons. The second shell can hold eight electrons. And you'll notice the way it's drawn that usually the electrons are going to be in pairs. 
This is an example of a partial uh, example of the periodic table, and it's listing the first 20 elements, and it is showing you by that two-dimensional diagram the placement of the electrons. Now, I always tell students, if you've never had chemistry, whenever you do take it, let the periodic table become your best friend. Everything you need to know is in that table. And the way the table is set up and organized is not random. There's a, uh, there is a method to that madness of how they put it together. You notice that you have different columns and you have different rows. In a nutshell, and some chemistry instructors may argue with me with this, but I would say here's chemistry in a nutshell. The rows correspond to the shells. The columns are going to correspond, for the most part, now in the middle section, it kind of goes by different rules, but on the ends, the columns are going to correspond to how many electrons you have in that outermost shell. So if you start at the top left, you'll notice at the very top left is hydrogen. It has one electron. Well, guess what? It's in column one, and it's in row one. So that means you only have one shell, and you only, because it's in column one, you only have one electron. Now, helium is an exception. It is in row one, so it has one only one orbit or one shell. You can use orbit and shell interchangeably. Now, even though it's in column eight, you'll notice that it only has two electrons. Well, that's because it's in the first row. It only has one orbit, and the first orbit can only hold two electrons. If you look at row two, they now have two shells. Row three has three shells. Row four has four shells. If you happen to look uh, at, say, column two, let's look at magnesium. Third row, second column. Third row means it has then three shells. It's in the second column. So how many valence electrons will it have? Valence electrons, remember, are the number of electrons in that outermost shell. So don't worry about the innermost ones. Just look at the outer shell, that third shell there, and you only have two. Now, you could very easily have determined that how because it's in column two. So the periodic table becomes, like I say, your best friend. When you look at the valence electrons, like I said, those are the ones that are going to be involved with any chemical reactions. In terms of chemical reactions and how stable things are, the bottom line is, the various elements are wanting to fill that outermost shell to completion, have it completely full, and then it becomes very stable. So when you talk about chemical reactions, what's happening here? Well, you're going to be forming different chemical bonds. What is a bond? That's where the atoms are either going to be sharing electrons or they're going to transfer the valence electrons. So those outermost electrons, they're going to either give them up or they're going to receive them. They're trying to stabilize. And we'll talk about the type of bond, what the name is, depending on whether it's being shared or whether you've transferred. Now, a molecule is two or more atoms that they're held together by the chemical bonds. And a compound is simply a molecule that has more than one type of element. You may have a carbon and a hydrogen, or a carbon and an oxygen, or two oxygens, etc. I said there's different types of bonds. We'll look at, there's three main ones that we look at when uh, we were talking about physiology and biology. Electronegativity, this is the attraction of an atom for electrons. The more electronegative an atom is, the greater the pull. Covalent bonds are going to be when the atoms are sharing electrons. When you share those electrons, they may be either polar versus nonpolar. Nonpolar covalent bonds, you're sharing them because it's a covalent bond. However, um, 
what's going to happen is it's it's sharing equally. And so um, it's kind of like you have an equal pull from both sides that are involved with that bond. So in example A, it's showing two hydrogen bonds. They are each sharing the electrons. <coughs> and then in the bottom, it's showing oxygen. You are sharing, actually in this case, two pairs of electrons in that outermost shell. Remember, it's only the outermost shell. But it's an equal sharing. And these are some additional examples of how you have that equal sharing occurring. Now, once again, this is showing um, kind of an abbreviated form of the periodic table. The numbers along the top are the numbers of the columns. If you are looking at uh, electronegativity, basically with the column and the rows, as you move from left to right, the electronegativity increases. As you move down the columns, the electronegativity increases, that, that pull towards the electrons. Um, for the most part, that's, that's what's going to happen. Now, um, just so you know, for covalent bonds, because you are sharing row, as I said, row one is, is different. You, you have a maximum of two electrons, that's it. But rows three and further down, to fill that shell, outermost shell is going to be eight electrons. If you're going to share to try to fill up your outermost shell, let's look at carbon, which is C. Carbon has four electrons in its outermost shell. It's in column four. So when you're trying to figure out how is it going to fill it up to capacity. It needs four more electrons. That's kind of hard to, to gra completely grab and take away four electrons from other atoms. That's, a, that's difficult to do. And do you just give up four of your electrons so it drops you back down to zero in that outermost shell? That's tough. It's easier to share. And so one thing you may notice is that in the middle of the periodic table, uh, columns, basically columns three through uh, five, sometimes six, are often going to be covalent bonds where they are sharing those outermost uh, electrons. Polar covalent bonds, it's still a sharing, however, it's unequal sharing. You have different atoms that have different electron activities. In other words, one may have a stronger pull towards those electrons than the other one does. Now, in this diagram, it is showing <coughs> for a water molecule the uh, that is oxygen that has the purple nucleus showing eight protons in there. And it would have eight electrons. It needs two more electrons to fill its outermost shell because it has six there. Uh, it has eight total, so two are filling the innermost, then it's got six in, in the second valence uh, shell or orbit, the outermost one. The light blue uh, nucleus are from uh, hydrogen, which has one electron. Because it only has one orbit, it needs two to fill, so it needs to gain one more. So it's easier to share. So you can see where you actually have two separate hydrogen atoms. They are sharing electrons with the oxygen. So now each of the hydrogens have two, and oxygen has eight electrons in their outermost shells. So you, you fill those shells. But what happens is oxygen is much larger than the hydrogen. So even though it's sharing those electrons, it's actually pulling those electrons closer to the oxygen than to the hydrogen. Think of it this way. You're playing tug of war. Hydrogen's a big old individual, uh, and oxygen's the huge one. So they're not the same size. If you're playing tug of war, and uh, let's say, You've got a toddler who's three feet high. That's 
the hydrogen, and they're playing against uh, an older brother who is 6'5", 250 pounds, and you play tug-of-war, who's going to win? Obviously, you're going to be pulling closer towards that, that, that oxygen. The hydrogen gets drawn closer. Now, does the whole atom be pulled closer? No, we're talking about pulling the electrons. If you're pulling the electrons closer to the oxygen nucleus, the electrons are negatively charged. That means that oxygen has a slightly negative charge or a partial negative charge to it now. The hydrogens, because the electrons have been pulled away from it and electrons are negatively charged, that means the hydrogens now have a slightly positive charge to them. This is going to lead towards what we call hydrogen bonds, which we'll talk about in a second. That polar covalent is simply an unequal sharing. Covalent, whether it's polar or nonpolar, those are the strongest bonds that we see. Ionic bonds, this is the second type of bond overall. This is, in terms of strength, the intermediate of the ones we are looking at. And this is, happens or occurs basically when you're not sharing the electrons. Somebody's going to give up electrons and somebody else is going to receive those electrons. Now an atom, if it's normally... Uh, neutral, because you have the same number of protons as you do electrons, and you give up an electron, you give up a negative charge, that now makes you positive. So let's just say you had, uh, you had three protons, you had three electrons, you, you give up one electron, you now only have two. So you have two negative charge, three positive charge. That makes you a positive charge. Atoms that have a positive charge are known as cations. If you receive electrons, you receive, let's say, an extra electron, that's going to give you a negative charge because you have more electrons than protons. A negative charged atom is known as an anion. Now, opposite charges attract. So somebody gives up an electron, somebody gains an electron. So the one that, that gave up an electron becomes positive. Somebody receives an electron becomes negative. Now the positive and negative charges are attracted to each other. <coughs> that is the ionic bond. Ionic bonds then are formed by the attraction of opposite charges. And oftentimes this is how salts are formed. So this is showing, uh, in this example, the formation of sodium chloride, which is a table salt. On the left, you have sodium. It has only one electron in its outermost shell. If it needs to fill it, it's got to have a total of eight. It has one. Are you going to find seven others to share with? That's tough. No. It's easier just to say, you know what, let me just get rid of this electron. Now, meanwhile, on the right side, you have chlorine, which has seven electrons in its outermost shell. Once again, it needs eight to be filled to capacity. So what does it do? It's not going to share with the sodium because although that one electron would complete the chlorine atom outermost shell to eight, it's not going to do that for the sodium. Sodium has to have eight to be filled. So, sodium gives up its electron. Where does it go? Well, chlorine only needs one more. Give it to me. And so it goes to chlorine. Because chlorine received that electron, it's negative charge. The sodium gave up electron, so it's positive charge. As you can see in step two, the positive and negative charges attract. And then that's how you're forming that uh, compound of sodium chloride which is a salt. One thing with ionic compounds is oftentimes when you put them into water, they will what we call dissociate. They will separate back. Uh, that bond is broken and they separate back into the ions. So you'd have the sodium with the positive charge, chlorine with the negative charge. <coughs> and that's what we see here. And this is very beneficial in 
all living organisms, not just microorganisms. This is very beneficial in humans. I said all organisms, because if you look at that salt, that sodium chloride, that is a very large crystal. You need to have sodium and chlorine for various processes within uh, the body for survival. In humans, sodium is necessary for a lot of things such as uh, electrical impulses, muscle contractions, etc., things like that. You can't get that large crystalline form inside a cell. It's way too big. There's a size restriction of what you can move across the membrane of a cell. This is way too big, but you need those components. So isn't this nice that when you put salt in water, it's going to dissociate into those individual ions, which now are much smaller and more easily to transport across membranes. So from a biological standpoint, physiological of how things function, this is quite beneficial. Hydrogen bonds are the weakest of the bonds that we study. Uh, in order to have a hydrogen bond, you must first have a polar covalent bond. Now you might think just because it's weak, it's not that important. Oh, yes it is. Hydrogen bonds are very critical and healthy to form the 3D shape or structure of a lot of our larger compounds. And something that uh, is said a lot, especially in like anatomy, is that structure determines function. You destroy the structure, you will destroy the function of that molecule. So what's making the 3D shape? Oftentimes it's those hydrogen bonds. So yes, uh, they are very, very important. This is an example of showing a hydrogen bond between two nitrogenous bases that are used in the makeup of both DNA and RNA. You have to first have um, the hydrogen bonds that are, are being formed, this unequal sharing, because that's what gives, if you notice for hydrogen bonding, where it is showing that hydrogen up at the top has a slightly positive charge. Why? Because it has a polar covalent bond with that nitrogen just to the left of it. The nitrogen is pulling the electrons closer to it, away from the hydrogen, so the hydrogen has a slightly positive charge to it. The oxygen that's on the guanine, it's bonded, those two lines indicates it's, it's got a double covalent bond to that carbon. But the oxygen has a stronger pull than carbon. So the electrons that it's sharing with the carbon are closer to the oxygen, thereby giving it a slightly negative charge. Well, opposite charges attract, just like for the ionic bonds, they're attracting with the hydrogen bonds. And so you get this hydrogen bond, that red dotted line, just by tradition, we, we tend to for, show, when we draw out bonds, we will show hydrogen bonds as a dashed or a dotted line. So here they are shown in red. So this is showing the, the different types of the chemical bonds. Usually the covalent bonds are classified together, and then there's subdivision, polar versus nonpolar. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, as I said, these are the type of bonds that you're going to see relative to the study of biology. Chemical reactions, this essentially is going to be making or breaking bonds. So you're going to involve your reactants, oftentimes called substrates, and then the products. What is it that you are, are making here? In terms of the types of chemical reactions, you can have a synthesis reaction. This is where you're taking smaller uh, molecules and you're forming larger ones. You're connecting them together. This will require uh, energy in order to, to form that, that bond, put it together. Um, so you're starting with something small and you're adding things together. It's also called a dehydration synthesis reaction because when you connect two things together water molecule is going to be released. Uh, we also will refer to this when we're talking about organisms. 
We tend to refer to this as a synthesis reaction. It can also be called a dehydration reaction. It is also referred to as an anabolic reaction. So all of those are terms used where you're taking something smaller and you're making larger. You're connecting them together, forming bonds to make a larger, more complex type of molecule. And this is showing here, as I said, you're connecting two things together when you form that bond you are releasing water as one of the byproducts. A decomposition reaction is when you're going the opposite way. You're going to break bonds with larger molecules, break those bonds to form smaller um, atoms. You're get, whenever you break a bond, that's going to release energy. We refer to this as a hydrolysis. Um, it's the reverse of the dehydration, so now you're going to have to add water in. And it's also referred to as a catabolic type of reaction. So whether you call it a hydrolysis, catabolic, or decomposition, as you can see, you have this larger molecule, you add water to it, you're going to break a bond somewhere along in there and form uh, smaller molecules. Exchange reactions, this is where essentially you're going to be breaking bonds and then forming new bonds. So you're, you're doing both. It's a combination. So you're going to release some energy, require some energy. You're, it's kind of like you're shuffling the deck around. Metabolism refers to the sum of all the different reactions that are occurring within the organism. Water. Water is going to be the most abundant substance that's found in organisms. It has a lot of special characteristics. Uh, it is necessary for life as we know it. Uh, just so you know, that's one of the reasons why we know that all living organisms require water. As I said, it's life as we know it. So as uh, explorations are being done and looking elsewhere, in our universe to see if there have been signs of, of life either now or in the past, one of the first things they do is look for the presence of water in any of its forms. Uh, and why is that? Because first you look for what you're familiar with. Now we know that if there may be life elsewhere, let's say on Mars, it may not be in a form that we are familiar with, but first you're going to look for the known, for the familiar. So that's why they're first looking to see was there evidence of water ever having been there and why they focused on the water is because life as we know it is dependent on water. Now water has a lot of special characteristics to it. Um, it has a lot of surface tension. That's essentially uh, what allows things to walk across the surface of water like little water beetles can walk across the surface of a pond. That's due to the surface tension. It's an excellent solvent, which means a lot of things can be dissolved in it. It remains a liquid across a very wide range of temperature. A lot of other compounds uh, that may be liquid don't have as wide a range. They become a solid or a gas much sooner than what water would. Water can absorb a lot of heat without changing the temperature. You guys have all personally experienced this. When you're really, really hungry and you need to fix something to eat that requires you to boil water, and you put water in that pot and you turn the heat on, and yes, the water's starting to heat. You know you're adding heat, but the water's not getting any hotter, and it seems to take forever. From a a living standpoint, this is good that you can be exposed at a wide temperature range without uh, having that temperature, internal temperature, change very much um, because it remains a liquid at that wide range of temperatures that allows you, once again, to be exposed at a wide range of temperatures without freezing, which without turning to a gas. <coughs> so this is very beneficial for microorganisms as well as all living things um, in terms of the wide temperature range and being able to absorb heat. Uh, in anatomy often 
share with my students my, my personal experience is the coldest temperature that I personally have ever been in was uh, 40 degrees below zero. Obviously very, very cold. Yes, you dress for it, but um, I had to walk in it briefly, but I was also dressed for it to be able, certainly I survived it, um, got inside soon, but obviously could survive it. The hottest temperature I've ever been at was a temperature of 119 degrees. Not pleasant, but obviously was my internal body temperature 119? Obviously no, because I'm here. <coughs> but I've been in this wide range. I'm not saying it's comfortable, but I've been in that wide range. Water does... Uh, Participate or is involved with a lot of different chemical reactions. So this is showing an example of how water is cohesive and it has that surface tension, as I said, allowing for things like this, uh, water beetles to walk across it. It allows it to kind of stick to different uh, substances as well. Acids and bases. Um, there are different definitions for acids and bases if you take chemistry. Uh, for biology, for this course in microbiology, we're just going to look at acid is uh, when it will dissociate and release hydrogen ions. A base is when it's going to bind with the hydrogen and you have a higher concentration of hydroxide, which is OH. You can measure the pH. Uh, scale which does go from 0 to 14. Uh, acids are going to be from 0 to 7. 7 is neutral and then a base is anything above 7. So it's going to be from uh, 7.1 up to 14. For most organisms in order for the metabolic reactions to occur, which translates to survival for the organism, you must have a uh, a particular balance of this acid and basis. You don't want the pH usually too high or too low. Some organisms have specific requirements. And so how do you prevent uh, changes, either the pH going up and becoming more basic or going down and becoming more acidic, is that you have buffers. Buffers will help to prevent any huge drastic changes in the pH. So this is just shown with an acid, yes, you have more of the hydrogen, and base, you have more of the hydroxide ions. This is a pH scale, just to give you some reference points. As I said, 7 is neutral. Ideally, that's where pure water is. It may not be your drinking water, but it's pure water. And as I said, as the pH um, decreases, it becomes more acidic. To give you an idea of some things, your stomach is about pH 2. Hydrochloric acid is pH 1. Uh, vinegar is acidic. It has about pH 3. If any of you do any mechanics, uh, battery acids, that's, that's very, it's almost at zero. Uh, so that's why you really don't want to be touching. Uh, your urine for a healthy individual is usually about pH 6. So all of those are very acidic. In terms of basic or alkaline, alkaline is the same thing as basic. Things like baking soda. Ammonia is about pH 11. We're getting pretty strong now. Bleach is pH 12. Sodium hydroxide is pH 14. Um, the one thing I do want to say is a lot of people are aware that when you're working with something that's very acidic, you need to protect yourself. You need to be wearing gloves. You don't want the acid getting on you because it can burn you. What some people fail to realize is that a very strong base can be equally dangerous and it can give you burns. And so you need to protect yourself there as well. Which is why, notice things like ammonia, bleach, some of these household cleaners are very basic or very alkaline. And that is why they have warnings. You know, the warning on the bottles that nobody reads says to wear gloves. The reason is so you don't uh, end up burning yourself, getting a rash from, from touching that concentrated uh, basic or alkaline material because it can burn. Salts, 
uh, salts will, as we said earlier, will dissociate into uh, cations and anions when they're added in water. And they can help transfer electrons from one location to another. They're very important with a lot of the metabolic processes that occur in any organism. One thing I do want to say about salts relative to acids and bases, you have to know what you are doing. So it's one of these do not do this at home unless you know what you are doing. But if an acid and a base combine, they will form salt and water. So that is one way that can be used to neutralize them if, say, you have a hazmat uh, spill. Um, I have seen this happen when I was working in a lab. There was a student who uh, basically dropped a bottle of concentrated acid. And um, he dropped it. The bottle broke. So we had four liters of concentrated acid on the floor. He immediately went to go grab some paper towels to clean up the liquid. And I commented simply that I wouldn't do that if I were you because the acid is just going to eat away the paper and essentially dissolve it. And he kind of went, oh. So then he went to go grab a, a mop, and I said, I wouldn't do that either if I were you. Think about, because it's going to chew up the mop. Think about what you spilled. It's acid. So then he sat down and finally, you know, took a breath. And um, I'll just say he was not speaking in English. I did not, I'm not a native speaker of his, his native language, but I can probably guess what he was saying. He finally took a deep breath and then, okay, this is the acid I was working with. Determine which would be the proper base to use. He then poured the, the base, four liters of the base on top of it. This is one of those interesting things where I was standing there thinking, okay, I know that if you have the acid, you mix the base it's going to form salt and water. That is what is supposed to happen. I also know that acid and bases can be very violently reactive. So I will be very honest with you and was thinking, oh, this is going to be really cool to see when he goes to add the base. However, I'm not going to stand right next to it. I'm going to stand by the door so that if this thing ignites, which sometimes they are flammable and will ignite, um... I'm running. I'm a big chicken and I'm running out the door. So he added the four liters of base now to that acid and there was smoke and hissing and all of a sudden this weird kind of whooshing sound and just kind of went whoosh. And then you just saw this pile of salt form and then there was water there. Now all he had to do was mop up the water and sweep up the salt and then explain why we had to buy more acid and base. Um, so it's things like that, that people who are trained to deal with hazmat situations, they're trained to know what you can mix with what to now neutralize the situation and then make it safe and easy to clean up. Functional groups. Um, Usually will contain a carbon and a hydrogen. They will appear in certain arrangements. Um, more in biology, certainly in microbiology, what I'm wanting to focus more on are some of our organic macromolecules. Now, if it's organic, that means it has carbon and hydrogen in it. Now, you have other atoms as well, but at least it will have carbon and hydrogen. There are four main uh, macromolecules that are, we see in biology, and those are your lipids, your carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids. When you talk about these groups, oftentimes you may refer to monomers. These are basically the building blocks of that particular macromolecule. So this table is showing some of the, the functional groups that we see associated with different organic compounds. Now, if we look at these macromolecules, lipids, these are your fats, your oils. They are what we call hydrophobic. A substance that is hydrophobic, as the name implies, hydro refers to water. Phobic is fear. It doesn't like water. It doesn't want to be near water. It doesn't want anything to do with the water. 
Oil and water do not mix. Why? Oil is hydrophobic. So any of your lipids will not mix with water. There really are not regular monomers or building blocks. It depends on specifically which type of lipid you are looking at. There are four main groups. There are fats, phospholipids, waxes, and steroids. So if we look at the fats, this also includes your triglycerides. You will notice that typically what happens is you have glycerol. Glycerol is a three carbon compound. Anytime you have glycerin, think three carbons. So glyceraldehyde, glycerol, glycerine, glycerate, all those have three carbons. So you have glycerol and then it combines with three fatty acids to form a triglyceride. If it is what we call a saturated fatty acid, that means that all of those uh, carbons have one uh, single covalent bond. The carbon can have four bonds. So all of them are going to be taken up by single covalent bonds in there. An unsaturated fatty acid, what an unsaturated fatty acid is, if you notice in B, about in the middle, you see there's a CH, two lines, and a CH. Those two lines indicate that you have a double bond there. So instead of having on each of those carbons, four bonds, there's only three. So it's not filled to its maximum capacity. <coughs> this is looking again at the type of chemical bonds that can be formed, and the strength of those bonds. Phospholipids are very, very important whenever you're discussing any type of biology. Certainly, microbiology is included in this. Phospholipids are a major component uh, in structure of things like your membranes. And what a phospholipid is, is you have your glycerol, that three carbon compound. Now, instead of having three fatty acid chains connected, you have two fatty acid chains, and then you have a phosphate group that's attached to it. This phosphate group, that portion of it is hydrophilic, but those fatty acid chains are hydrophobic. And this is, when we study the cell, is going to lead to certain unique properties of the membrane. Where, as you can see in the diagram here and C, in the membrane you have what we call the phospholipid bilayer. You end up with two layers of just repeating uh, phospholipids lined up. And you notice the way they, they orient uh, themselves is that with those fatty acid chains of both layers pointing inward towards each other. So in that yellow area where the fatty acid chains are, it is hydrophobic. But on the blue area where the uh, phosphate group is, that is hydrophilic. This will play a huge role as to what can pass across that membrane and how easily things can pass across the membrane. <laughs> waxes. So we're still talking about our lipids. Waxes tend to contain one long fatty acid chain uh, that's going to be combined or linked to an alcohol. They do not have a hydrophilic, hydrophilic head, so they are completely insoluble in water. They don't have that hydrophilic area. Steroids typically on A have that basic uh, template. It is a ring structure, four rings that are connected together. Uh, an example would be cholesterol, and then you add to that. You add different structures onto it, maybe another ring structure, maybe a chain of something. <coughs> Steroids are very helpful. Uh, also in the cell membrane, they help to stabilize uh, the membranes. Carbohydrates, these are your sugars. Uh, they're going to be composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They will be in the ratio for, of, now here it's written as CH2O. Now you can have any number of that. Glucose, which is probably your most common carbohydrate, is C6H12O6. So whatever number you have of the carbon and oxygen, those would be the same, and hydrogen would have uh, double that amount.
What's the function of your carbohydrates um, for energy? It is the first primary source of energy for any cell. And you can also store chemical energy in this form. It forms the backbone of your nucleic acids. It can be converted to many other compounds, helps to form the cell wall. <coughs> Probably one of the main functions is, is for energy. There's different types of carbohydrates. You have your uh, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Monosaccharides are going to be your simple sugars, such as glucose, as you can see here. It is often drawn as either a chain or in that ring structure. You put things in water and often it will change shape. Disaccharides are simply when you have two monosaccharides that are connected together. In the case of sucrose, you connect glucose with a fructose and you have sucrose. Uh, you, this reaction is reversible in terms of do you have your dehydration where you're connecting it together, forming the sucrose, or do you have the hydrolysis reaction where you are breaking that sucrose down into the smaller glucose and fructose uh, compounds? Polysaccharides is simply where you have a long chain of these uh, sugar molecules that are connected together. Cellulose is a long chain of basically sugars. They are connected together. You have, so you have these long parallel chains. You have these other uh, structures connecting each of the chains together. <coughs> Cellulose is the most abundant organic compound found on Earth. Glycogen, which is found in animals, is also long chains essentially of glucose that are connected together, but there are branching uh, side chains coming off of it. Starch, which is uh, found in plants, is also a long chain of glucose, but without the branches. Proteins, the monomers are amino acids, so that's the building block. Uh, there are only um, roughly on average about 20 amino acids and it's how you put these together in long chains that form the various uh, proteins. As you can see here it's showing an example an A of an amino acid. Of the different amino acids, they all will have, if you look at that structure, there's a central carbon from that. On one side, you will have a carboxyl group. Directly opposite of that will be the amino group. And then you'll have a hydrogen and then the R. The R just means that's your variables like solving for X in algebra. That is where the difference may be. And as you can see in B, it shows you several different types of amino acids. And what it is showing is that that R, it may be as simple as a hydrogen, as the amino acid glycine is. Or it may be a ring structure, as you see in phenylalanine. That's where the differences of the amino acids are. Is what is that R structure? It may be simple, it may be more complex. Glutamine, where you start out as a chain and looks like it branches then. In chemistry, biochemistry, they'll often talk about stereoisomers, how some molecules are mirror images, and so they will refer to them as either L for left or D for right. Dwight is, is D, what the D stands for. Um, for the purposes of general microbiology, um, I just want you to be aware of this, that that's what it's looking. One is a mirror image of the other, and so that's what that letter may mean, the L or the D. Which version of it are you looking at? You will not have to be able to recognize or identify the L or the D in this introductory microbiology course. So the amino acids, you, you've got all these multiple amino acids. You link them together by a dehydration reaction. That's what it is. Remember, you take smaller compounds, you link them together, water is released, and you end up with a larger compound. You formed a bond there. That is a 
peptide bond. Now, a peptide bond is simply a covalent bond. And you might be thinking, you did mention this type of bond earlier. Okay, it's because, I don't know, we're, we're going to annoy you. Okay, It's a covalent bond, but we decide to give it a special name when it's between amino acids, and that's why it's called a peptide bond. With proteins, we have different names for the level of structure. The primary structure is just referring to what is that sequence of amino acids that you are combining together. What is that chain? Is it alanine, alanine, glycine, etc.? Or is it phenylalanine, valine, glycine? What is that sequence? Now, where does that information come from? It's going to be on the DNA. We'll talk about that later, how it's actually going to be controlled in synthesizing or making those proteins. But for here, that primary structure is that sequence of amino acids. Now, because of the various R groups that are different, depending on which amino acid it is, sometimes you may form hydrogen bonds between different amino acids. And that's going to cause some regional structural formations. And that's what the secondary structure is. Some areas you may form kind of this twisting uh, structure, kind of looks like a slinky, uh, that we call an alpha helix. In other areas, you may have this structure it kind of looks like a zigzag or if you're used to making like when you were a kid and you'd fold a sheet of paper and make a paper fan it's kind of that that folding like that we call it a beta pleated sheet is the entire protein folded in one of these areas no just a small section and within one protein you may have say four areas separate areas where there are alpha helixes and you may have beta pleated sheets intertwined in there as well. The tertiary structure is what is the overall three-dimensional structure of that protein now. <coughs> you put it all together, what is that structure? And that may be it for the protein. Some proteins, not all, but some proteins, you have these subunits that have to fit together. And so the quaternary structure would be in the formation of that protein. How do the subunits fit together to form the overall 3D shape? So the, in that case, the tertiary structure would be the 3D shape of the individual subunit. And then the quaternary is how do you fit all the subunits together for the overall shape? So we've talked about the lipids, the carbohydrates, and the proteins. So the fourth group are going to be your nucleic acids. This, this, uh, the subgroups, there are two types. You've got DNA and RNA. DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is ribonucleic acid. DNA contains all of the genetic information. RNA is going to be involved with protein synthesis. Um, now, there are some viruses that do not contain DNA and instead contain RNA. And just to let you know, actually, viruses, um, they will never contain both DNA and RNA. They only have one type of nucleic acid. And we use that actually for classification purposes. So your first way of classifying viruses is, is it DNA or does it have RNA? Because it will never have both. Now, other organisms, such as bacteria and fungi, they will have both types of these nucleic acids. So the nucleic acids, what are they made up? Well, their monomer is what we call a nucleotide. It's composed of three components. It has a phosphate group. It has a sugar, which is a pentose, meaning it has five carbons. That sugar is either going to be deoxyribose for DNA or ribose in RNA. And then it's going to have what we call a nitrogenous base. There's five different nitrogenous bases. Uh, in DNA, you can find four of these. In RNA, you will find four of them. Now, 
And this is where I know it can get annoying. Nucleotide is the building block of a nucleic acid. If you take the phosphate off of a nucleotide, then we call it a nucleoside. So it would just be the nitrogenous base with the sugar. So in this diagram, we have the nucleotides. Uh, as you can see in A, you have one nucleotide. You have the pentose sugar attached to that is going to be on one end is going to be the phosphate group and attached on the other side will be one of these nitrogenous bases. So the sugar is the middleman, if you will. That in B it is showing you <coughs> excuse me, the two possible pentose sugars, the deoxyribose versus the ribose. In C we are looking at uh, those five different possible nitrogenous spaces. If we go across the top, you can see they're divided or subdivided even further as to either a purine or a pyrimidine. Purines are, as you can see, a double ring structure. There's two of them. There's adenine and guanine. We, with these uh, bases, we tend to abbreviate and name them by the first letter. We always capitalize that letter. So the purines are A and G. One way to remember which ones are the purines, which one are the pyrimidines. Purine, pure as gold. A, G is gold. And so as is A, gold, G. The pyrimidine, even though it's a longer word, it's a smaller compound, it's only a one ring structure. Uh, thymine, which is T, this is only going to be found in DNA. And then you have cytosine, which is C, and then you have uracil down at the bottom, which is U. Uracil is found only in RNA. Now, A, G, and C are found in DNA as well as in RNA. So DNA can have A, T, G, and C. And then your RNA can have G, C, A, and U. The nucleic acid, the structures of them, um, you can form hydrogen bonds between the G and C. There would actually be three of them. And then you form only two bonds between in the A and the T if you're talking about DNA. In RNA, because it doesn't have a T, it would be between A and U. DNA, in most cases, it will be double-stranded. We say those strands are complementary. Uh, you, if you know the base sequence, the sequence of the G, C, A, and T on one strand, you can determine what the other strand is. And they're running in opposite directions. They are connected. They, it is what we call a double helix because the whole structure is slightly twisted. Um, I'm saying that in most cases this is true. I will let you know that viruses, uh, they play by their own rules. And they've never read your microbiology book. And they don't care what your microbiology book says anyway. So you will find there are some viruses that the DNA is single-stranded. Normally RNA is single-stranded, but there are some viruses that have a double-stranded RNA. So because viruses play by their own rules, and like I say, they never read your book, they don't care about your book, when we go to classify viruses, one of the first things you do is, number one, what kind of nucleic acid does it have? Is it DNA or is it RNA? And so you separate it that way. Then you look at whichever type of nucleic acid it is. Is it double-stranded or is it single-stranded? Now, one way of trying to remember uh, how many hydro hydrogen bonds are between these different bases, as I said, uh, normally you're looking at DNA. So A and T has two hydrogen bonds. 
and G and C will have three hydrogen bonds. There are several different ways you can use to help remember this. Uh, one way that really kind of surprised me one time, I did not come up with this, it was a student. Uh, I've heard several different versions. I've had some students and other instructors tell me different ways to help students remember this. I will not repeat all of them. But this one was one that a student did. She came up to me one day and started asking me how many apples were in a tree. And I had no clue what she was talking about. Because we have been talking about genetics, not apple trees. And finally she explained to me the way she remembered it. You have two hydrogen bonds between A and T. For some reason, she said that's two ap apples in the tree. Apples for A, tree for tree. And then for the GC, she said everyone dreams of having a three-car garage. I'm a big pro proponent of use whatever you can to help you remember. Okay, how you do it? Just whatever helps. So if that helps you, two apples in a tree means two hydrogen bonds between A and T. Three car garage means that there's three hydrogen bonds between G and C. And this is a picture that's showing just kind of the general structure. As you can see, uh, this is showing with uh, DNA specifically, that under A you have a chain and it's Remember, alternating the sugar, in this case deoxyribose, is in the middle. So you're going to have the phosphate group, the sugar, now sticking off of that, it's the base. So you form what we call the uh, backbone chain, which is going to be alternating phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, and so on. And remember, off the sugar is going to be your basis. Because in B, you can see the DNA is double-stranded. Those bases from each of the two strands point inward towards each other, and that is where you are forming the hydrogen bonds. That's where you have the apple tree and the, the three-car garage. Uh, so the A, this what we call complementary base pairing. A always binds with T, and G and C always bind together from one strand to the adjacent strand. And then you can see how it twists into that that. Uh, it's a double helix, it's double stranded, and it forms that helical or that twisting shape. As I mentioned earlier, DNA contains all the genetic uh, material, so it's basically controlling everything that's occurring within uh, the cell. And this is a comparison uh, table showing uh, comparisons between DNA and RNA. And then here we have a ATP, and it's the same adenine, A. We have a ribose sugar connected to it. This would be the nucleoside. Now, when you connect just one phosphate group to it, it's called adenosine monophosphate, or AMP. When you add a second phosphate onto that first one, it's now ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And then you can add a third phosphate group onto it, and it's called ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. And why are we mentioning this? It is because ATP, that adenosine triphosphate, whenever you see that compound, you think energy. Those phosphate bonds there contain a high amount of energy. And so whenever the cell needs energy, it can break off. If it has ATP, it breaks off one of those phosphate groups. If it has ATP, it could also break off a phosphate group, releasing that energy that it needs. And then when it has excess energy, it just puts a phosphate group back on. So what you will find out when we talk about physiology of microorganisms, as well as it's true for any cells, is that you are constantly going from ADP to ATP and back, adding on phosphates, taking off, adding on phosphates, taking off. It's kind of like the cell's energy uh, ATM machine.